I wanted to bring this lesson here, um, which I have brought uh, in other places, and I thought it would be useful to go through this, and um, not necessarily everything and all the detail, but I think it's worth looking at it together and thinking about these things before we part ways today. So, we are looking at the question, when did the Church of Christ begin? This question is intended to elicit in your mind kind of a historical perspective of what is this. And, and you know, does it come from heaven or does it come from man? You know, what's the nature of this thing? Um, in point of fact, observation would tell us plainly, most people think the Church of Christ is an American Christian denomination. That's the truth um, about the way that we are perceived in the world. Most people think of it as a church or a religion. You know, you'll um, hear people say, oh, we're Church of Christ, or, uh, you know, oh, we're not Church of Christ. We, you know, we don't do it that way, as if it's like a label or something. That, that's not accurate. It is the church that belongs to Christ is what it is, and that's simply not true. But, you know... I noticed that there are reasons why uh, people are confused about it, and I think it's understandable that there's confusion about it. Uh, one thing is that denominations, all the American, you know, human churches, have co-opted the language of the Bible. They, they pick up and use these terms that are found there, and that kind of makes it sound like they're trying to do what it says. I went to the Southern Baptist Convention's page, um, and I picked them because they're serious and they're sincere. I wanted to be honest in the representation of what they believed and, and pick people who really mean it and uh, really study. And that's the Southern Baptist Convention. That, you know, the number one thing on their page is the scriptures. You know, that sounds like, oh, you know, like the Bible's really important to them. Um, but on that page, it says the supreme standard. The Bible is the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried, meaning put on trial. We put these things on trial by the supreme standard of the word, the scripture, the Bible. That sounds pretty good, but it's actually not very good. If, if you, you look, look at what, what it says, says what, what it clearly, clearly is, is saying, saying is that they accept human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions. And that they're accepting this as part of their faith. It's on the faith and mission statement. But what they do is... They turn the Bible into the standard by which they are tried. What we mean by this is that they, they find something that they're doing or something that they're believing or whatever, and before they adopt it officially, they test it by the Bible. What it means is that the Bible is not dictating their beliefs. The beliefs come first, the practices come first, and then they go check to see if it's okay in the Bible first. You know, can, we, can we fit this in there? Can we shoehorn this into some verse or another somehow? That's the way that they deal with the Bible. That's not the same as letting the Bible dictate what you believe and what you teach. And that comes down to the, the most basic error of all. Um, what came first, the community or the teaching? What came first, the Bible or the church? Well, the Bible's first. The Bible gives the church. In every generation, whoever obeys God, that's what they are. So, yeah, the world is confused about that. And people, you know, reading, reading it, it might uh, think that that sounds good over there, but really it's not. They're not letting God be the author of what they do. It's also the case that inside the churches, some of our most prominent teachers have actually claimed that this is a Christian denomination in America. Um, the one that I think of is probably most prominent is Ed Harrell who was a well-known and well-cited scholar uh, among religious circles. People outside of the church who are scholars, who are theologians, who have gone to seminary, they know who Ed Harrell is. He's the expert on the churches of Christ. But he said it was a denomination. He said the Bible could not be understood alike, and that we could not attain unity through the scriptures. Um, and I can give you the quotations. He said in 1964, it's published, the Journal of Southern History, the Churches of Christ are Native American religious movement. Supposed preacher in the Church of Christ saying that the church is native to North America and that it's a religious movement. That's not true, but that's what he said. 
1964. He said they are the, the spirited offspring of the religious rednecks of the postbellum South. He was making the argument that the churches of Christ are, are uh, coming from the division of North and South in the, in the Civil War. Which is interesting. I don't remember what verse that was, though. I don't remember what verse he cited. In 2010, he's on YouTube giving an interview at Florida College um, in retrospect of uh, Christianity Magazine and all the things that they taught there about Romans 14. And he still calls it a movement. If you're a part of a movement that says every person has the right to read the scriptures and determine what they say and we're bound to do what we believe the scriptures teach well you live in a wild democracy see what that is he says you can't understand the bible you read it and i read it and we're both being truthful we can't get down to the bottom of it it's a wild democracy that's not true truth exists truth is absolute that's not true but then you look at the practices of the churches, the churches themselves, and you know, even you know, down here on the ground, I mean, that's, that's some, you know, whatever, right? Fuddy-duddy, uh, scholar guy, preacher, preacher going around doing talky-talk. Yeah, okay. But down on the ground, when you look at the churches, you look at the websites, you look at the bulletins, you look at the articles, you can see that many of the churches have adopted the terminology and the practices of the denominations. I just went to one website where, frankly, I was sure I would find it, and it was there. Non-institutional church, not liberals. They don't believe in the fellowship hall, the fellowship meal, the, the orphan orphanages, the old folks' homes, the pooling of funds. They believe in none of that. But on their website, I saw these things, devotionals. Youth lectures, teen weekend, Valentine's dinner, food, games, singing, fun. This is on their website. I saw the pictures of the young people engaged in the food, game, singing, fun, having the barbecue out at the park together. And what verse is that? I don't know. No verse for these things either. All of these are borrowed from the denominations. That's all borrowed. None of that comes from the Bible. The Bible doesn't use the word devotion that way. The Bible never talks about separating the young people from any other people. We all have a need for the word of God and the young need the old and the old need the young. The Bible doesn't talk about that. It's just not there. That's, there's a perceived need and an actual need. And certainly it says clearly in 1 Corinthians 11, what don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're not, not coming, coming together, together for social activities. We're not coming together for meals in the work of the church as though we, this is something that God wants and God prescribes that that's not in the Bible. No. And then somebody says, oh, well, you're against us having dinner together. No, I'm not. I'm against you announcing that from the pulpit, putting it on the website as if it's a spiritual work of the local church because it's not. In fact, I wish that we would get together more often for dinner. <laughs> Not just because I like to eat, but because I think it would be great for us to know each other better than we do. Okay, so don't, don't get the wrong idea there. But on the same page I found, these activities are privately sponsored, funded by individuals who are invested in today's youth. Yeah, what's wrong with you? Why don't you like young people? You know? No, disclaimers won't deliver on the Day of Judgment. You're only fooling yourself. You're not fooling God. God sees what you're doing. It's not a question of funds and allocation of funds and, you know, where's the money coming from? It's a question of the work of the church. If it's on the website, if you're encouraging them to participate, it's a work of the church. Even if you say it's not, and they do, they say, although it's not a work of the church, we encourage participation. Because our teens find these associations with other Christians very spiritually uplifting. Well, is it privately sponsored or is it spiritually uplifting? Is it physical and earthly and social or is it spiritual and related to the church and the work of God? Which one is it? You can't have it both ways. You're only fooling yourself. But it, it does, does make, make it confusing. confusing. 
People think the church is a denomination for these reasons and others. But that's basically it. The truth is the Bible is right about this. We go back to the Bible. The Bible will dictate what we should do and what we should believe and how uh, we ought to serve the Most High. So if you're, you know, if you're of a mind to look at this together with me, one of the first things that you find that is a clue about the, the beginning, beginning, the establishment of the kingdom, is what Jesus said to the, the crowds in Mark 9. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. This means there are people alive at the time that Jesus is preaching, somewhere around 30 AD, plus or minus. I don't want to get in an argument about years. Men invented calendars, you know, which means they're prone to mistakes. Okay, But somewhere around 30, Jesus is teaching, and there's somebody standing there listening to him. Probably that person's at least about 20 years of age. In that day and age, you were an adult at 20. Today, you know, in our country, we say 18. They said 20. At least 20 years old, probably, in, in about A.D. 30, that person is, who is standing there, and he says they'll see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. Somebody alive at that time, maybe as young as 20, he said they won't taste death until they've seen the kingdom come. So sometime in the lifetime of that person, the church is going to exist. The kingdom is going to exist. How long did they live? What was their average? Their average was in the 60s. So, you know, you're looking at, let's put a top end of AD 100. Sometime before AD 100, this happened, right? The kingdom is coming with power. Luke 24 is the other place to go when you talk about the kingdom coming with power because there the resurrected Lord gives instructions to the apostles at verse 49 saying, well, actually, uh, well, that's, yeah, that's right. In verse 46, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem you are witnesses of these things behold I send the promise of my father upon you but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high so the kingdom is coming with power there to stay in the city of Jerusalem though they are the witnesses, they're to stay in Jerusalem until they're clothed with power from on high. So they're waiting for the kingdom to come. He said the kingdom's coming in the lifetime of people standing there. It's coming with power. The power is coming until which time they hang out at Jerusalem. They're going to stay in the city. When you fast forward in Luke, you get over to Acts, which Luke also wrote. And in Acts 1, and at verse 8, the resurrected Jesus, right before he ascends into heaven, tells them, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The kingdom comes with power. You stay in the city till you have received power. Acts 1.8 you will receive power when? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay, so we're waiting for them in the city to receive power. And that happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The power is also the sign of the coming of the kingdom. And this also happens in the lifetime of people who are listening to Jesus teach at Mark 9.1. You with me so far? So far, so good. Right. So you scroll on down or turn the page, whatever you're doing today. In Acts 2, 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit came upon them in Acts chapter 2, and they began to speak at that time as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance to say things. What's happening there? Well, he said the power was coming with the Holy Spirit come upon them. He said the power was coming with the kingdom. You may remember in Matthew 16, when Jesus was asking the disciples, testing them, you know, who do people say that I am? And you get various answers to that. But then he turns it on them. 
Remember? And you, who do you say that I am? The verse 15. And Peter gives the good answer. You are the Christ, the Son of God. But did you remember that at verse 19, the Lord said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I realize that the religious world makes too much out of Peter and they think he's the first pope and whatever. There's no verse for that. But this is still there. He said to Peter as an individual, you're getting the key. Why did he say that? Because when they were in the city, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, when they were clothed with power from on high, and Jesus had given Peter the keys. What's the key for? It's for opening, opening the door, opening the gate. When they were gathered like this, then you read in Acts 2, 14, that Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, lifted his voice and began to address the crowd. There you go. That's the key. He's opening the door to the kingdom right there. It's Acts 2, 14. And what is the door to the kingdom? Well, it's rather specific, actually. He said to them in the 36th verse of Acts 2, Let the house of Israel know for certain God has made him Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. And they, on hearing it, were caught to the heart and said to Peter and the rest, Brothers, what do we do? It's fairly plain. Peter's reply is captured at Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit's gift. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far away, everyone the Lord calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort the crowd, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And all those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. But we point out Acts 2.38 because these details are the identifying characteristics of the kingdom. We're saying here that Acts 2 started it all because it's from this point forward that the details of baptism, the one that you need, the one that they command that you do, are in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. From this point forward, it is spoken of in this way. That's the identifying characteristic. You go over to Acts chapter 10, you see where um, the Romans are finally included in this thing. Acts 2 was a message to the Jews who were devout, or I'm sorry, who were devout and sincere and gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Well, for the Passover and Pentecost, the festivals. In Acts 10, the gospel goes to the Romans who'd never heard this before and didn't have an upbringing in the Old Testament. But even they believed. And in Acts 10, verse 47, Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice who said that? It's Peter. Notice what he said? Baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38, Peter said, Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's the exact same thing. The only thing that's added in Acts 10 is water. You need the water to do this. That's why in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is looking for water there in the desert. That man was scanning the horizon, looking for a body of water, knowing that he was lost and he needed to be baptized. Water finally shows up and he says, Behold, here's water. Now what hinders me from being baptized? And nothing did. They did it. Because this is how it started. That's the commandment of the Lord. 
they had received the Holy Spirit baptism, but that's not the one. They were commanded to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And you know what kind of baptism that is. It's a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. It's a baptism in water. It's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you go forward in time to Acts 19, you find that the Apostle Paul comes along among uh, some people in Ephesus who had been baptized in uh, John's baptism. And he came to realize, when they didn't know about the Holy Spirit, that they didn't have Matthew 28. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, they didn't have that yet. And he said to them in verse 4, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is Jesus. And they, on hearing it, were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Exact same thing that you read in Acts 10 and in Acts 2. And again, there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that happens there in Acts 19, just like it had happened in Acts 10, and just like it had happened in Acts 2. But in Ephesians, when Paul sends a letter to these same people afterward, he writes to them in the fourth chapter and the fifth verse that we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There can only be one baptism, even though they had witnessed the baptism of John, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Which one do you think is the one baptism? It's fairly obvious, isn't it? They had John's and he said, that's not the one. You need this. And they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Then the Spirit fell on them in Acts 19. But in Acts 10, they had received the Holy Spirit already. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's clear, very clear which one it is. There can only be one and that's it. It hasn't changed at all. That's exactly what we're doing. It's no different, not an iota different. It's the exact same gospel. It's the exact same means of salvation and for the exact same reasons. Hmm. Let's talk about secular history for a minute. Yeah. Regarding church history, regarding, you know, church fathers, archaeology, all that kind of stuff. You know, they're not inspired, is one thing. The Bible is inspired. These records of history, uh, archaeology, these people who said they were witnesses but they're not the apostles, that's not inspired. That doesn't take precedence over God's word. Satan is allowed to have lying wonders. There are some, some crazy, crazy things, things, some, some unexplained, unexplained things that have happened in the world. And I don't pretend that I have an explanation for that, but I know what God's word says. When it comes to secular history, friend, if, if you're, you know, if you've never done it or are new to this idea, archaeology especially, but archaeology, history, whatever. These studies are based on what is left behind after people are gone. They're looking for traces of evidence. What's going to happen? <laughs> you know, put yourself in ancient Israel. Listen to the words of God through Moses. You shall have no carved images, no likeness of anything above or beneath. Right? What did he tell them about the country they were going into? You're going to inherit houses you did not build, fields you did not plant, cisterns you did not dig. If you are really faithful to God, if you're a real child of God, what do you have? You have Palestinian architecture and you have zero traces of religion. There's no idols. There's no crosses. There's no beads. 
There's no trace. What are they going to see when they dig up the ground there? Oh, well, these people were Palestinians. We don't think the Israelites existed. You fool. <laughs> That's what it said you were going to find. You will find nothing. They would leave no trace because my kingdom is not of this world, John 1836. If it were, my servants would have been fighting. See, that's not what we're about. That's not what we're here for. It's not of this world. We leave no traces. What are they going to find of churches of Christ? Not going to be crosses. It's not going to be gold. It's not going to be idols. Nothing. There won't be a trace. They might say, man, there's a lot of Bibles in this house, but <laughs> not going to happen to anybody, I guess. You understand? That's just not the way the truth is established. And those things can lie, and those things can be misunderstood. It's not reliable. You know what our history is? Our history is the Bible. In Acts chapter 8, when there was a persecution that arose, and the Christians were being thrown into jail and tortured to death, they were scattered from Jerusalem, and they spread. They were, there were thousands of Christians at that time. Thousands. 20,000 plus maybe 30, 35,000 of them. They were scattered from there. And Acts 8, 4 tells you that those who were scattered went about preaching the word. That's the scattering that 1 Peter starts with. He talks about the 12 tribes. And it's the scattering that James 1 talks about, the scattered tribes, or the tribes of the dispersion. Those are the first letters of the New Testament. But Acts 8, 4 said, They who were scattered went about preaching the word. What identifies them? Where they came from? No. The building that they were in? No. They didn't even have a building. They met in the portico of Solomon. What's that? It's outdoors. <laughs> Was it free? Well, probably not. I can think of no place that lets you gather tens of thousands of people at no charge. It was probably not free. No. But they met outdoors. They, they left no trace. What characterizes them is the word of God that they had and that they preached. And when Paul, when Paul is dying in Acts 20, well, he's about to die. He knows that he's going to his death. He summons to him the elders from Ephesus and tells them a whole lot of things. But one thing very important that he says to them in verse 32 is now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul leaves. He does not leave a successor. He does not leave a succession. You notice that Peter did the same thing in Second Peter. He said, I've written these things that you may call them to mind at any time after my departure. He does not name a successor or a succession. He points them back to the word of God. Paul said, I now commend you as I leave this world to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance. Remember when Moses was to die, he summoned the children of Israel to them and he said, I am not going with you, but the Lord is going with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Yep. Yep. Peter said, we have a prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention. You want a history? That's a history right there. You want a people? That's a people. Something that's worth living for, something that's worth dying for. That's it. In the Revelation, he said, 22, Verses 18 and 19, if anyone adds to the words of this book of prophecy, God adds to him the plagues that are in it. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God takes away his share of heaven that's in it. Now somebody says, ah, oh, well, that's just about the Revelation. No, it's not. The Revelation quotes every other Bible in Scripture, or every other book in Scripture. <laughs> so it covers the entire Bible. All of the Bible is covered by this. You don't add to it, you don't take from it. The Bible is our history. The Bible is right. And in Jude, the brother of the Lord writes to the church. He says, in retrospect of 
Second Peter, you know, he's at a time when the apostles are gone. And he's reminding us of the things that the apostles wrote. It sets an example for what you and I are supposed to do when we teach today. And he said to them in the third verse, I wanted, I was eager to write you about our common salvation, but I had to write to you appealing to you to contend for the faith. See, he wanted to write about our common salvation, but he couldn't do it because salvation was not something we had in common. That's what he's saying. Instead, I was compelled to write you saying, you need to fight for the faith. In the 17th verse of Jude, he said, You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to the Bible. The Bible is right. Contend for the faith once for all delivered. And yes, third letter of John, in the 12th verse, the apostle relates this to us. The Bible is our history. The Bible is our book. That's our people. And if you have a testimony, it's not the testimony of your name, your family, your lineage, your ancestors, some historical movement in North America or anywhere else. Your testimony is the truth that you obey, the truth that you believe, the truth that you confess. Sir John 12 said, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone, which is good. We want to be an encouragement. We want to build each other up. But what really matters, Demetrius has received a good testimony from the truth itself. Let God be true, there, though every man be a liar. You know, our testimony is the Bible. What do you need? You need book, chapter, and verse. And that is your testimony. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Here's what it says in Scripture. This is what they did. This is what that accomplishes. See, that's your testimony. That's who you are. Or is it who you are? I hope that it is. Are we speaking today and you're not a Christian? You're not a child of God? It's time to become a child of God. It's time to obey the gospel of Jesus. There's no reason to wait any longer. There's, There's no, no reason, reason to put that, that off. Embrace the Lord. Confess that I've been wrong and that God is right and I'm going to make my life right with Him from now on. Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Put Him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. As Peter said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my words in this crooked generation, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father. The emphasis there should be this. You're ashamed of me? And look around you among this? This world? This nasty place? And you're ashamed of Jesus? No, that's not the way to be. Change your heart. Embrace the Lord. We have water prepared for you to be baptized in His name, following exactly the pattern that we just read. If today you are a Christian and haven't lived right, repent. Turn to God. God is reliably merciful. If you will turn in genuineness and sincerity and in an earnest prayer of repentance with a conviction and um, you know, every strength, every effort to go forward in what is right, God will hear you. God will forgive you. I know that that's true. I've just read it too many times. It's just everywhere you look, all over this book. The kings did terrible things. The people, the people did terrible, terrible things, but, but when, when they humbled themselves, when, when they turned to him, when they cried to the Lord, the Lord heard them from his holy habitation, and then the Lord forgave them. He will forgive you too. We'll pray with you and for you as well, because nobody's above temptation, and there's not anybody here who hasn't done the things that you're talking about. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known in the Spirit by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. Amen.